Yeah, now I've gotten several at least. Thank you. Wow, they're getting, they're getting bigger and more fragrant as I'm here. This is wonderful. Well, I still haven't learned how to pronounce this place yet, where we are today, but David Hawking called it canoe last night, I think. But uh, anyway, it's, it is great to be here. And I agree with you, Cheryl, and I commented at the same thing as we were there about the, the worship team. What a wonderful job they do here but at the conference. And part of that may be because we, uh, we had already been here and we already have a, a kindred spirit and affection for the folks here, but we really enjoyed that very much. We want to thank you all for that. And just for uh, the great hospitalities we've been here, it's been wonderful. I think I mentioned this the other night. This is my second time to be here, Cheryl's fourth time. But the last time, we, the other times we've been here, you know, just came over here to, to vacation the one time. But this is the first time to be here and, and, and uh, be in churches. And when I come to churches, especially here as beautiful as it is, I'll always remember being here. And on Sunday mornings, we'll remember you along. I have always think about churches and pray for the pastors. Now, the time difference is a little bit different. But I was getting up on Sunday mornings, I know for the next few weeks, um, I'll remember uh, this place and uh, the, the dear people here and, and your pastor and just uh, the, the, the wonderful spirit that's here and uh, the truth and the love that we've talked about before. I want to uh, bring a message this morning uh, about seven signs of the end times, looking at some of these signs of the times. We've talked about a lot of different things in this conference, but I thought it might be good to just look at how things in our world are shaping up, uh, really, as the Bible has predicted. Uh, to get started, though, I want to look at... Uh, all right, I've got a little, uh, I've got a list here. Uh, let's see. Huh. Oh, well. Well, that's all right. If you uh, were able to get this up there, I don't need, I, I can read it to you all. I have to have it up there. But I've got a, a list. It's called uh, 10 uh, Ways to Know If You're Obsessed with Bible Prophecy. And it's one of these top 10 lists. And so you can kind of go through this and see how you fit in here. Number 10 is you use the Left Behind books as devotional reading. Uh, number nine, uh, you get goosebumps when you hear a trumpet. Number eight, you believe the term church fathers refers to Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye. Number seven, you believe there's an original uh, Greek and Hebrew text with Schofield's notes. Uh, number six, you can name more signs of the times than you can commandments. Number five, you refuse a tax refund check because the amount comes to $666. I said you better take a tax refund or a tax refund any way you can get it nowadays uh, number four barcode scanners make you nervous uh, number three you adapt your you talk your church into adapting the 60s pop song up up and away as a christian hymn uh, number two you never buy green bananas in other words the lord can come so soon you know and number the number one way to know if you're obsessed with bible prophecy is you always leave the top down on your convertible in case the rapture happens well, I'm, I'm not obsessed with Bible prophecy, uh, but I certainly do enjoy studying it because to me it puts the whole Bible together. Um, I'm a, a pastor of a church, and we go through books of the Bible, and so we don't just talk about prophecy all the time. We don't want to make that a, you know, some kind of a hobby horse. But to me, if you love the Bible, you love prophecy. Because 28% of the Bible was prophecy at the time it was written, and so the Bible itself is a book of prophecy. Uh, the Bible tells us where the world's headed. I mean, it shines the headlights out into the, the darkness to show us where we're going. And it answers all the questions, or many of them, that people are asking today. And people are asking a lot of questions. Uh, the world today, as we've mentioned several times, is filled with a lot of fear and of a lot of anxiety and uncertainty. And people everywhere kind of have this collective sense that the world's getting near closing time. I like to say that apocalypse is in the air. It's just kind of like there's an uh, uh, apocalyptic feeling or a sense that's out there in the world today. 20% uh, of Americans believe the world's going to end um, in the next couple of decades. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, the economy, the problems, natural disasters, terrorism, uh, nuclear weapons in the wrong hands. Those of you who were there yesterday probably heard me talk about, you know, these pandemic plagues. You know, I saw a deal a while back called it Apocalypse Now, you know, these, when the swine flu was out there uh, going along. But, but people are asking questions like never before. And when I talk to people on uh, some of the TV and radio interviews I'm privileged to do, people want to know where's America in prophecy. Uh, they want to know uh, if uh, President Obama is the Antichrist. You know, people ask those kind of questions. Which, by the way, 24% of Republicans in a recent poll said they thought he might be the Antichrist. Uh, was the world going to end in 2012? Um, how much longer can the tensions in this world uh, be held in check without the, the lid blowing off? 
Uh, so people have all kinds of questions about the future, and the only place to find these answers is in the Bible. And the Bible tells us that there will be signs that we will see that portend uh, the coming of the Lord. Back in uh, Matthew 16 and verse 1, it says, The Pharisees and the Sadducees came up, and testing Jesus, they asked him to show them uh, a sign from heaven. But he replied to them, When it's evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for uh, the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm today, for uh, the sky is red. And th- uh, in, in, in the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you, do you not know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but you cannot uh, discern the signs of the times? So what happened at that time period is Jesus was on the earth and Jesus was uh, here doing the things that the Bible says the coming Messiah would do. And so Jesus was uh, healing people. He was traveling about doing the things that the Bible said the Messiah would do at his first coming. And Jesus says, you all are are a great amateur meteorologist. Uh, You know how to look out and discern the signs of the times or or the, the, the sky and the heavens and the weather. But he says the problem is you can't see the signs of the times. In other words, the signs were pointing them to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. And I think the same way that there were signs of the first coming of Jesus that tell us that Jesus is the Messiah, there will be signs of the second coming of Jesus as well that will tell us that he's coming again. You remember uh, two days before Jesus uh, died on the cross, in uh, Matthew's gospel, in Matthew, a little bit further in Matthew, in chapter uh, 24 and verse 3, the disciples asked Jesus, they said, when will these things be? Uh, What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus didn't say, well, don't worry about it. You don't worry about any signs or anything that's going to happen. I'm going to come back someday, and it's just going to be a big surprise. Don't worry about it. Now, what did Jesus do? In Matthew 24, Uh, verses 4 to 31, he lays out a whole list of all these signs that will portend um, his second coming back to the earth. And one other passage I might mention is in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, There's a verse that probably a lot of us are uh, familiar with in Hebrews 10 where uh, the writer there says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but encourage one another And then he says, and do it all the more as you see the day drawing near. So he's saying, look, we need to be gathering together and fellowshipping and being with one another and encouraging one another, but do it even more as you see the day drawing near. Well, let me ask you the question. If we can't see the day drawing near, then how are we going to know when to do that? It presupposes, that statement does, that we're going to be able to in some way see that day drawing near so that we know how much more we need the fellowship uh, with one another. And so I think the Bible tells us there are many signs that will indicate that the coming of the Lord is near. And according to the Bible, there are a series of what I call uh, kind of carefully timed events that serve like signposts um, on the road to Armageddon. Uh, They're events that cast their shadows before them before they get here. We live in the time today of we might call the preparation of fulfillment of prophecy. Did we, did we able to get those uh, slides? Maybe we can get that one up there. Um, the one that's got just the, kind of the timeline and all. Can you do it from back there? Okay, there it is. Great. Now you notice you know, every Bible prophecy teacher has to have a chart, right? <laughs> notice over on the left-hand side where it says the current church age or, or the preparation for fulfillment. That's where we are today. And then see, one of these days, the rapture is going to happen. And then after the rapture, there's probably going to be a further time of preparation. Because see, a lot of people will ask, well, you know, how's this or that going to take place? If the rapture were were to occur today, how could the tribulation start? Because this thing or that thing's not in place. Remember, the rapture could happen at any time. And the rapture, though, doesn't start the seven-year tribulation. Hopefully, we all know that. The event that starts the seven-year tribulation is a covenant between the Antichrist and Israel. That's what actually starts the tribulation. So when the rapture happens, it could happen today, and the tribulation might not start for another week or month or even another year or two years. We don't know. But the tribulation will start when Antichrist makes that treaty. So at some point, the rapture is going to happen. There will be some time of further preparation. Then that treaty will be signed, and the tribulation period will start. But we live 
still on that side of the rapture. We live in the time of the preparation for the fulfillment. What we see today primarily is not the fulfillment of prophecy, although there are a few prophecies being fulfilled. Primarily what we see is the stage being set for these prophecies to be fulfilled. Because when you think about it, the events of the end times can't occur in a vacuum. There has to be a setup. And we live in the time of the preparation. So what I want to do is look at seven of the key signposts on the road to Armageddon that according to the Bible uh, strikingly foreshadow uh, what's going to take place in the future. And, and really we see events today we could say on fast forward. I mean it's like things are accelerating before our eyes. Now the first of these signposts I want to mention is the one that we all know about and that is the regathering of the nation of Israel. Uh, I call this the super sign of the end times. Because all the other events of the end times are, are, in, are, in, are in, in, uh, dependent in one way or another upon Israel being a nation. Because think about it, when uh, the event that starts the tribulation period is the signing of a covenant between Antichrist and Israel. We can't sign a covenant with Israel if they don't exist as a nation, so they have to exist. One of the other events we're going to look at a little bit later is Israel's going to be invaded in the end times by a group of nations um, from, in Ezekiel 38. Uh, they're going to come down into the land of Israel when they've been regathered to their land. Well, again, they can't invade Israel in the land if Israel isn't in the land. So this is the super sign, and it has to occur. And in 1948, Israel became a nation. And at that time, about 6% of the Jews in the world uh, lived in the nation of Israel. Now it's almost 40%. And last year, for the first time since 135 A.D., there are now more Jews in Israel than any other place on earth. There are more Jews in Israel now than there are in the United States. And according to Ezekiel 37, and really a host of other Old Testament prophecies, in fact, some have said the most prophesied event in the Old Testament is the regathering of the Jews to their land. But Ezekiel 37, you remember pictures, the bones, you know, the dry bones coming together, and then the skin comes on and the flesh, and then the, God breathes into them. It's a picture of Israel being regathered. And initially they're regathered physically to the land, and then ultimately they're going to rega be regathered spiritually to the Lord. But they're being regathered to their land. And what other generations dreamed of seeing, we now are able to see. Did you know that there's never been a group of people that have been exiled from their land that remained a distinct people? The Jewish people have been exiled from their land, though not once, but multiple times. And they remained a distinct people. The last time the Jews were put out of their land in 70 AD by the Romans, uh, they, they ended up in 70 different countries of the world. And they were there for 20 centuries. And yet God brought them back as a distinct people to their land. And in the late 1800s, their language, ancient Hebrew, that had died was revived. I mean, it's a miracle. Uh, in fact, the, the, the modern nation of Israel is often called the miracle on the Mediterranean. Last year, for the first time, as I said, there's more Jews now in Israel than any other place. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was in seminary, Dr. Pentecost, J. Dwight Pentecost, he's got a great book called Things to Come. In fact, Dr. Pentecost still teaches there. He's 96 years old, teaches two classes a week now. But he said uh, back in the 40s, late 40s, he was driving home one night from a camp he'd been speaking at in Pennsylvania. And as he was driving home that night, he said, uh, you know, a lot of you remember the old radio, you know, the old AM, you know, trying to get stations at night, kind of crackling. And he says he was listening to this station and a, and a news uh, bulletin came on. And they came on and interrupted to say that earlier that day, May the 14th of 1948, that David Ben-Gurion had announced the establishment of the modern state of Israel. And that 11 minutes later, uh, Harry Truman had recognized the establishment of the state of Israel. And he said he had to pull off the road because he began to weep. Because what people had said for hundreds of years was going to take place, he was hearing with his own ears at that time. I have a, a great book. Uh, I love it. It's one of my favorite ones by J.C. Ryle called Are You Ready for the End of Time? And J.C. Ryle wrote in 1867 when he wrote this book. And he said, I don't know how it's going to happen. It seems impossible. But he says, the Bible says the Jews have to be regathered to their land. And I believe it has to happen someday. And every time I read that, I just get a chill down my spine. Because I think if J.C. Ryle could have seen what we're seeing in our time, 
uh, today. About uh, a year ago, I had an opportunity to talk with a, a chemistry professor from our local university there in Edmond, Oklahoma, where we live, and he's an atheist, and he'd found out about me from some of my, some writings and other things, and he'd been reading the Bible and reading prophecy and all kinds of things, and he wanted to talk to somebody about the Bible, about creation, and about the prophecy and all this, but he, he claimed it to not believe or maybe be an agnostic. He just didn't really know about the existence of God, and we talked for a real long time about all kinds of stuff, you know, creation, and his main thesis was this. He kept saying, look, if something can be explained naturally, then we don't have to look for a supernatural explanation, and I, I agree with that. I mean, if we can explain something naturally, we should do that. We don't need to look for the supernatural to explain natural things. But I made the point to him, I don't think you can explain how everything exists naturally with the order that it has. You know, I don't care how much time and luck you have and chance, you don't get the order that we have. But he disagreed with that. We talked about all kinds of things, but finally near the end of our conversation, I made a point to him, and I, I, it just came into my mind, and I think the Lord helped bring this to my mind. I said, you know, have you ever wondered about the Jewish people? And he said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know what? Abraham was selected by God to be the father of the Jewish people and for the Messiah to come. This, they, were, they were hunted, hounded, persecuted, uh, several times nearly wiped out, and yet God preserved them. And I said, if you, uh, you know, they, they're sent into 70 countries for 20 centuries. God brings them back. Here they are now back in their land with a distinct language. And for the first time in all the things that I said to him, I could see that he was, it was giving him pause. And he said, you know, that's the first thing that you've said that I don't have a natural explanation for. As I said, you know, people haven't for, for 2,000 years persecuted the Italians, you know, or the Irish or anybody else. I mean, they may have each had their time of persecution, but everywhere they go, they're persecuted. And the reason is, when God promised that it was through Abraham the Messiah would come, Satan worked feverishly to try to wipe out that line so the Messiah couldn't come. And you remember a couple times it was down to one descendant of David who was alive. In one case in Joash, a little baby, you remember, and he was preserved by God. If he would have died, that line would have been cut off. But Satan was unsuccessful in that. But now I, Satan's on what I call plan B, where now he's trying to wipe out the Jewish people because the Bible predicts the Messiah will come back someday and rule over uh, the Jewish people. So he's trying to thwart God, God's promises by wiping them out. He tried to do it with Hitler, and he tried to do it ultimately with the Antichrist. But I pointed out to this fellow, I said, you know, every time that... Now, somebody tries to wipe out the Jews, the Jews get a holiday. Have you all ever thought about that? I mean, when Pharaoh tried to wipe them out, they got Passover. And when Haman in the book of Esther tried to wipe them out, they got the Feast of Purim. And when Antiochus Epiphanes tried to do it during the intertestamental period, they got Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights. And when Hitler tried to do it in the 30s and 40s, they got uh, the national holiday of May the 14th of 1948, which is the rebirth of their nation. I mean, here these people are. I mean, one of the greatest proofs of the, of the truth of the Scripture is the Jew. It's the Jewish people and how they just keep coming back. And the whole world is focused on Israel even now. I mean, it's the headlines every day. So to me, one of the great signposts of the end times that we see lining up is what we see happening in the nation of Israel uh, today and in the last 60 years. A second key signpost I'd mention is world focus on the Middle East. The whole world is focused on the Middle East. History began there. I mean, I remember when I took uh, social studies in the seventh grade. We talked about Mesopotamia, you know, the land between the rivers. I mean, that's where it all started. History started there. Um, history's most important event occurred there with the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the Bible also tells us that history is going to end there at Armageddon and in the Middle East. The Middle East is, is the central stage for the events of the end times. And it's the focus of the world today. And even 40, 50 years ago, people would have laughed if you would have said, the focus of the world is going to be on these nations over there in the Middle East. Nobody cared about that place. But it's the focus of the world today. And there's three reasons today why people care about it. One is because Israel is there. Secondly, it's because the oil is over there. I like to call a 1973 for America, I call that the crude awakening. Because if you were alive during that time, you remember the Arab oil embargo. 
long lines to wait for gasoline. And uh, I still remember when I was a kid, you know, my dad going, <clears throat> buying gas for 20 cents a gallon, you know, they'd have these gas wars. But I mean, it went up at that time, you know, 30 something, 40 cents a gallon. And uh, back then we imported 35% uh, of our oil here in America. And we were worried back then. I mean, literally those nations have us over a barrel over there. But now we import 70% of our oil into our country today. So our focus is on that part of the world. It has to be because for the foreseeable future, uh, fossil fuels um, are going to be uh, what powers the world economy. The world uses 85 million barrels of oil a day. That's 1,000 barrels a second. It's, a, uh, it's an Olympic-sized swimming pool every 15 seconds. I mean, it's 5,500 Olympic swimming pools every day that get drained um, of oil that the world uses. And 60% of the world's oil, or actually about 66%, about two-thirds of it, is over there in the Middle East. And 40% of it flows through that narrow little strait of Hormuz every day, which has Iran on the east side of it. Now, there's a good question to ask at this point. Who put that oil over there? God did. Why isn't all that oil in South America or here in North America? It's right over there, and could it be that God put it all there so that people in the world would have to be focused there so it would become the staging ground for the end times. <clears throat> I call it the providential presence, if you will, of that oil that's there. But a third reason the world's focused on the Middle East is terror. The world today is a more dangerous place than it's ever been before. Threats of uh, terrorists getting their hands on WMDs is the, is the one major threat in the world today. And in our world today, the oil and the terror are focused in the same place, and that's part of the problem. I mean, it's a long supply line to get all that oil from the Middle East all over the world because it's in the most dangerous part of the world. And that exposes our vulnerability as a nation. We use 25% of the world's oil in America, 21 million barrels of oil a day. And so the West has no alternative but to protect our oil supply at any cost. And so the world today is focused on the Middle East like never before. And I think that's another one of these signposts that points to uh, the coming of Christ. Let me give you a third one. A third one is what I call the, the rise of the reunited Roman Empire, the rise of Europe led by ten kings. Turn back to the book of Daniel for just a minute, to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And you'll remember in Daniel 7 that Daniel is seeing here world empires pictured by wild beasts. And Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 are parallel chapters. They're, they're really giving us the same thing from two different perspectives. You remember in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this great statue. And the head was gold, the chest and arms were silver, the belly and the thighs were bronze, the legs were iron, and the feet were iron and clay mixed. And what that pictures, according to the interpretation God gave, is Babylon was the head of gold. Then the chest and arms of silver were the next great empire that was Medo-Persia. Then the belly and thighs of brass were the next great empire, which was uh, Greece. And then the legs of iron were the Roman Empire. But then the feet were iron and clay, and the feet have the ten toes. And those ten toes are called ten kings. And we know the Roman Empire never existed in a form where it was ruled over by ten kings. So that tells me that that's going to have to be fulfilled sometime in the future. And isn't it interesting, those feet are of iron and clay mixed together, which has the idea that they're together, but they're not, they don't really cohere to one another, which is exactly what we see with the nations of Europe. Uh, there's a federation, there's a union, but there's still difference between them. When you go to Daniel 7, the same thing's pictured as Babylon is a lion, and Medo-Persia is a bear, and Greece is a leopard, and then you have this last beast that's this ugly-looking, nondescript kind of beast, but it has ten horns. And the ten horns parallel the ten toes in Daniel chapter 2. And what that tells us is Rome, the Roman Empire, the last of those empires, has to be ruled over at some time by ten rulers or ten kings. And I take these to be ten kings because you remember in Daniel 7 and verse 8, he says, while I was contemplating the horns, that is those ten horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. 
And three of the first horns were pulled up out of the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. So this little horn is a man. He's, gonna, he's the Antichrist, the final world ruler. Well, if that little horn is a man, it makes sense to me those other ten horns are also individuals as well. So I think what this tells us is the final world empire, the Roman Empire, which was never replaced by another empire, is going to be uh, brought back together uh, sometime in the future in the end times. So what I see happening is after the rapture, the world's going to be in a state of chaos. People are going to be looking for somebody to bring some order out of the chaos, an iron fist, if you will. And I think that's going to happen under a reunited Roman Empire under a rule of these ten kings. And so I think that's when this is going to be fulfilled. And after what we saw a minute ago is after 1,900 years of being dispersed, the Jewish people have come back together. And now after 1,600 years of the Roman Empire being divided up, it's begun to come back together. It began in 1957 with the European Economic Community. The countries in Europe, the nations there got tired of fighting and killing one another after two world wars. And they said, you know, it might be better if we came together and formed an alliance. Finally, they got the Maastricht Treaty in 1991 that formed the European Union. 27 nations are in the EU today. 16 of them use the same currency called uh, the euro. I think the way is being paved for the rise of Antichrist and those 10 kings. Uh, the European Commission had 27 seats, but it was whittled down not long ago to 14. It could be whittled down eventually to 10. Also, did you know they have a presidency in Europe? They've had it for quite a while, but it was a rotating office. Just every six months, it rotated to a different country. It's kind of a figurehead type deal. Well, here recently now, they've established a, an actual presidency, an individual who's elected or, or selected by the commission, and they have a new president there. And this is what's fascinating to me. The term for their new president is for three and a half years. And the Bible says you know, the Antichrist is going to rule the world for 42 months or time, times, and half a time or three and a half years. That's interesting. So they have a presidency now, and there's some former Belgian prime minister uh, that has uh, that office now. But the Roman Empire will be reunited in the end times. What we see today is not the fulfillment of that yet, because we don't see the Roman Empire reunited, ruled over by ten kings. But what we see today, I believe, is setting the stage or paving the way for that to take place. Let me give you a fourth signpost, the decline of the United States. We are the lone superpower in the world today. But if Europe, a reunited Roman Empire, is to become the dominant power in the world, then something's going to have to happen to the U.S., right? Either we're going to be hooked in with Europe with this great power or something has to happen to us. The number one question I always get asked about Bible prophecy wherever I go is, where is America in Bible prophecy? Now, I've never been asked where is Brazil in Bible prophecy or where is New Zealand in Bible prophecy or some other place. And, of course, we ask that because we're Americans, but also it makes sense that America would be mentioned somewhere, doesn't it? I mean, we're the greatest military, political, economic power that's ever existed. Yet the word United States or America never appears in the Bible, and I don't think America is even pictured symbolically anywhere. Some people will say that America is uh, that unnamed nation in Isaiah 18, or that we're the young lions of Tarshish in Ezekiel 38, or that we are uh, that great city Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. Or some people even say we're the, we're the ten lost tribes of Israel. There's all kinds of views out there about that. But I don't think America is mentioned in any of those places. You say, well, what's the significance of that? Well, I think that means something dramatic is going to happen to America. Because I think as great of a power as we are, if we were the dominant force in the world during that time, I think God would mention us. I mean, he mentions Russia, or Rosh. He mentions the, the kings of the East. I think he would mention America if we were that great power in the end times. So I think something must happen to America. Now you say, well, what's going to happen? Well, we don't know because the Bible doesn't say. But we can use sanctified speculation, I think, about that. I mean, it could be a, some type of a nuclear 9-11 God forbid that would ever happen here, but it could. I mean, it could be economic. 
Um, the, the debt in our country is crushing our nation. There was an article in uh, Newsweek a year ago that I read. It really, really woke me up. It, it had a picture on the front of it of the U.S. Capitol turned upside down. And the title of the, of the cover, in fact, it was, on, uh, it was last December 7th, if you want to look it up from a year ago in Newsweek. And the cover said, How Empires Die. And the main thing it had in there is the main thing that's caused, they went back and looked at empires from history. The main thing that causes them to fall is debt, massive crushing debt. They went back and looked at some great empires. Their debt got so great that to pay their debt caused them to, to not be able to keep their military what it needed to be. And their military began to crumble because they were in such massive debt and eventually they were overrun and overtaken by other nations. I think that's instructive because you look at the, the, the uh, difficulty in our nation of the economic disaster and, you know, the, the China and other nations coming and buying up all of our bonds and buying up key financial uh, U.S. institutions. Think about the, the dependency we have on oil. I mean, think about how bad our economy is now. If oil, you know, if gas went to, you know, $5, $8, $10 a gallon because of some catastrophe over um, in the Middle East, no one knows for sure, but these are all scenarios that could take place. There's a quote, some of you probably heard this from Alexander Teitler. He said this, he said, the average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. During those 200 years, these nations always progress through the following sequence. From bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back into bondage. Now, I'll let you figure out where we are on that scale, but we're certainly in the latter half of it. Many people believe our country is going to fall from within. Uh, years ago, back in 1857, listen to what this British uh, parliamentarian said. This is 160 years ago. He said, your republic, talking about America, will be as fearfully plundered and laid waste by barbarians in the 20th century as the Roman Empire was in the 5th century. With this difference, the, Han, the, the Huns and the Vandals who ravaged the Roman Empire came from without, and your Huns and Vandals will have been engendered within your own country. It's a pretty prophetic word from 160 years ago. Look over in your Bible in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. This is a, a very sobering chapter to look at in light of, of our nation, or really any nation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 talks about God's wrath. There, there are three different aspects to the wrath of God in the Bible. There's what we might call God's direct wrath. You know, that's like Sodom and Gomorrah or the flood. You know, when God directly comes and brings his wrath to the earth. There's another kind of wrath we often call eschatological wrath or the day of the Lord wrath that God's going to pour out in the future during the tribulation. But there's a third kind of wrath we don't think about very often, and that we could call that the wrath of abandonment. It's an indirect kind of wrath where God pours out his wrath by basically turning people over to their own sin. Look at chapter 1 and verse 18 of Romans. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed. It doesn't say will be revealed. It is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And he goes on down in verses 24 to 30, to 24 to 32, and three times, and you see it in verse 24, in verse 26, and in verse 28, where three times it says, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them up. That's the wrath of God that's being spoken of here. It's the wrath of God abandoning people to their own sinful ways. And literally to give them over to it means more than just God taking his hands off. It actually means God gives you a push in that direction if that's where you want to go. Now let me read verse 24. It says, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, literally the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. What this is saying is God gave people over to impurity, the lusts of their bodies. What is that talking about? A sexual revolution. That's what happened in our country in the 60s and on into the 70s. 
Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. What would we call that? It's a homosexual revolution. Started here in the 1980s in our country and still going unabated today. And I've lived in my lifetime. I was born in 1959, and so in my lifetime, I've seen firsthand the, the, the sexual revolution in our country and the homosexual revolution. And then in verses 28 to 32, it says God gave them over, and basically it's just the open encouragement of evil. Now here's the rub in this passage. What this passage is saying, it's not saying when this stuff starts to happen, God will judge you. What it's saying is when you see this stuff happening, it's a sign God already is judging you. He's turning you over to your own sin as a culture. Now that's a sobering thing to think about because people always ask me, well, when's God going to judge America? And what's the answer? He already is. He's turning us over to our own uh, sinfulness. Now the question is, do we just give up then, throw in the towel, say, well, man, things are going downhill. You know, it's all over with. Well, I don't know God's mind. God may rescue our nation if we turn to him. But it starts with each one of us individually. You know, I can sit around and talk about how bad the culture is out there. But if I'm living an ungodly life and living a life of immorality, if I'm hooked on pornography and, and it's a $14 billion a year industry, if I'm involved in all this sexual sin in our country, well, how can I say, boy, our country sure is going downhill if I'm doing those things myself? We need to get our own act together and turn to the Lord. That's all we can do. The only person I can control what they do is myself. And if we will do what God wants us to do. And the other thing I think as a nation is we need to support Israel. I think as bad as our nation is, one of the reasons God has blessed America is our support for Israel. God said in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham, those who bless you all bless, but the one who curses you I must curse. And America, as bad as we've been in a lot of areas, overall we get a good report card on our treatment of the nation of Israel. And I'm concerned about that now and the way and the direction we're headed right now and now. So it's one of the things that we need to, to focus on. Here's my thesis, though, that I'll give to you. I think America will probably remain, a, a, hopefully, a strong nation until the rapture comes. I think God's judgment on America is going to be the rapture. If you look at the statistics, about 10% of the people in America, if you ask them, answer correctly of how you get to heaven. That is, that you get there through God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But think about if that number is correct. That's 30 million people gone in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, the salt and the light out of this country. Now, there's believers all over this world, but over in the Middle East, it's, you know, point something percent. In Europe, it's less than 1% now of, of true um, evangelical believers. So I think America would be devastated. You talk about a drop on the Dow Jones the next day. You talk about unpaid mortgages, you know, a mortgage crisis. Think about 30 million people, the salt and the light of this country, disappearing in a moment of time. I think it'll devastate this country. I think America will go from a leading nation to a following nation, probably become part of the empire of the Antichrist, looking for some uh, place uh, to find refuge. I saw a church sign recently down in Denton, Texas, and the church sign said, The Rapture, the Separation of Church and State. And uh, I like that because that's when it's going to happen someday. God's going to make the separation when it, when it happens. But I think America is going to decline. That's the only way that I see we can explain how these other nations are going to rise. Because in, in Revelation 13, verse 4, it says about during the tribulation, it says, who is like the beast or the Antichrist? Who can make war with him? In other words, he's going to be running the world. Well, if he's running the world, that means America is not running the world unless we're somehow in league with him or, 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 or confederate with him. So I think America is going to be brought to her knees, and I think it will probably take place at the rapture when that event takes place. So that's another signpost out there I think that we see. Now let me mention a fifth one of these signposts on the road to Armageddon, and that is a peace treaty. You remember one of the great features of the ancient Roman Empire was called the Pax Romana, or the Roman Peace you know, they built roads everywhere, and there was stability overall in the world, which allowed cultures to flourish. 
Well, the Bible says that the event that starts the coming tribulation period is what I call the new Pax Romana, the new Roman peace. It's this Antichrist is going to come and make a treaty with the nation of Israel. This is one of the key events of the tribulation. Remember in Daniel 9.27, it says that he, that is the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many in Israel for a period of seven years. And that idea of a firm covenant can even have the idea of a forced covenant. That he's going to force this upon uh, the nations there. We'll look a little bit later at Ezekiel 38, but it says in, when these nations invade Israel in Ezekiel 38, they're going to be at rest, living securely. They're going to be at peace. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says this. Paul says, you don't have any need for anyone to write uh, to you about the times or the seasons. For you know full well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. For while they are saying peace and safety... Sudden destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman, and they will by no means escape. There's going to be a time of peace and safety as people are crying out and yearning for it. Then all the way over in Revelation 6, as the very beginning of the tribulation takes place and the seals are open, the first seal is a rider on a white horse. He's a false messiah. Because Jesus, remember, comes on a white horse in chapter 19 at the end. This is at the beginning, a man coming on a white horse. And the rider on the next horse, it says, there's a rider on a red horse who takes peace from the earth. So he can only take peace if there is peace. So that means this rider on the white horse must bring some kind of peace to the earth. So we see in Daniel 9, Ezekiel 38, 1 Thessalonians, Revelation, all of these speak of this idea of a peace at the beginning of the tribulation. What does the world want more desperately than anything today? Peace. Peace in the Middle East. With Hamas and Israel and Hezbollah and Iran over there, I mean, it it looks like things could boil over and threaten to bring the whole world into it at any time. So the world yearns for peace. And after the rapture, these ten kings arise, these ten horns, but a little horn comes up among them, that little horn of Daniel 7, and he's the one who's going to come and make that peace treaty. Now, people are always trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. And I always tell people, if you ever do figure out who he is, i got bad news for you. You've been left behind. Because you're not going to figure out who he is till after the rapture. Because you see, the restrainer has to be removed for Satan to have the power and authority to bring his man on the scene. And I take the restrainer there is the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit through the church. Here's an interesting thing to think about. Satan doesn't know when God is going to bring the events of the end times to pass. So I believe Satan has a man ready in every generation. There's always an antichrist out there. Satan always has somebody ready. But one of these days when the Lord removes the restraining influence, takes the church out of here through the Spirit, then Satan's going to be able to bring his man on the scene, the Antichrist. And people always wonder about who he is. One of the big questions is, could he be an American? Could he be a particular American? Sometimes people want to know. American president. Um, I don't think the Antichrist will be an American. Because in Daniel 9.26, it says that the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city of Jerusalem. Well, who destroyed Jerusalem? The, The Romans did. And it says those are the people of this coming prince. Now, I don't think that means necessarily that he'll be an Italian, but he'll be from the old Roman Empire somewhere. Now, some will say, well, but America, we're an extension of the Roman Empire. You know, we we came out of these nations of Europe, but I I don't think that's what it's saying. I think he's going to come from somewhere within the Roman Empire, Europe, North Africa, the western part of Asia. Those were the, the, the parameters of the old Roman Empire. There's another a group out there that asked the question, could he be a Muslim? In fact, a lot of people are saying he may be the Mahdi, you know, that they're expecting when he comes. The problem with that is, according to Daniel 11, the Antichrist is going to exalt himself, the Bible says, above every God. And he's going to declare himself to be God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, it says he's going to exalt himself above every God and declare himself to be God. Well, a Muslim can't declare himself to be God because the major tenet of Islam is there is one God who is Allah. 
And so no man could proclaim to be God. If he said he was God, then he would, by necessity, not be a follower of Islam anymore because he'd be violating the major tenet of it. Now, he could be someone who used to be a, a follower of Islam, or he could be someone who used to you know, be involved in Christianity or any other religion. But he's going to be one who's going to declare that he himself is God. And the Islamic Mahdi will not come and declare that he is God. He's going to declare that he's a servant of God or of Allah. So to me, the fact that the Antichrist declares himself God and is worshipped by the world um, eliminates the idea that he could be a Muslim, at least while, he's, uh, while he is uh, declaring himself to be God. So I don't hold to either one of those ideas, an American Antichrist, an Islamic Antichrist. But he's going to appear, this Antichrist is, at the beginning as a great peacemaker. He's going to bring the new Pax Romana. And again, ever since 1948, what has one president after another and one secretary of state after another worn themselves out trying to do? Trying to get peace. Where Jimmy Carter, you know, had, uh, you know, uh, a Sadat, you know, together in Begin, I think it was, and then you know Ray or, uh, uh, Car- or uh, Clinton in 1993 had uh, Rabin and, and Arafat there on the lawn of the White House. You know the, these Oslo Accords. You know they have these big deals, and what happens? It, it falls apart. You know Hillary Clinton right now is working on trying to get a peace over there, and I'm not against trying to do that in the meantime. But I'm just saying it's not. None of them are going to pull it off. But when he comes. He's going to be Time's Man of the Year. I mean, he's going to get the Nobel Peace Prize because he's going to do something that no one else has been able to do. And if we don't see the stage being set for that today, then then what else is there? I mean, that's what the world wants. Let me give you a sixth signpost, and that is uh, the Battle of Gog and Magog. If you have your Bible, turn to Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38. It says in Ezekiel 38 and verse 1, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal. It goes on down in verse 5 and says, Persia and Ethiopia and Put. Verse 6, Gomer with all its troops, Bethel Garma, it's giving these nations of this great alliance. And by the way, there's a, uh, this is a great point. You probably couldn't figure this out. A great Bible scholars, a uh, Uh, Ezekiel 38 comes after Ezekiel 37. I know that's a great point there. But what's Ezekiel 37 about? Regathering of Israel. The dry bones coming together. Them coming together as a nation. What happens after they get together as a nation? Ezekiel 38 and 39, they're attacked by this coalition of nations that are listed here. And you'll notice the names here. It's Rosh or Roosh, which I take as Russia. There was an ancient group of people way north called the Ras or the Rasapu. Uh, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Togarma, all of those are in what today is modern-day Turkey. And people used to say, well, now Turkey's never going to join this because they were an ally of Israel. What's happened in the last couple of years? They've turned against Israel. Remember that flotilla that came in that Israel had problems with? There's a lot. It was Turkish. And the Turks have now kicked Israel out of there. They won't let them do any military exercises. In the last two months, both Newsweek and Time have had major articles in there about how Turkey is going back to the east. They're getting alliances with Russia, with Iran. They're turning back to their Islamic roots. So we see that happening uh, before our eyes. Uh, There's that, uh, oh yeah, there's the slide I've got there. Uh, I call this the final jihad. You'll notice Israel, and look at at how these nations encircle them. You got Kush, which is modern-day Sudan, which is Islamic. You have Put, which is modern-day Libya. It should be, could be a little further over. I didn't have room on my map. It's modern-day Libya, which is a radical Islamic nation. You've got uh, Turkey now moving back to the east. You've got Russia. You've got Iran. You know, they call him uh, Ahmad Genocide or, you know, Ahmad Dina Jihad or all these different names you can come up for. But, you know, they're looking for their Mahdi to come back in Iran, and, and, and Ahmadinejad's trying to hotwire the apocalypse. He's trying to make it happen. And he wants to wipe the Jewish people um, off the face of the earth. It's, they're mentioned here in Ezekiel 38, verse 5, Persia. The name just became Iran in 1935, and then the Islamic Republic of Iran in 1979. So we see these nations here coming together. Did you notice on this map, though, in, in Ezekiel 38, none of the near enemies of Israel are mentioned. Isn't that interesting? It doesn't mention Egypt or Syria or Lebanon or Jordan. 
Those are the nations that are called, the, you know, they're the near enemies. These are the far enemies of Israel. Now, people say, well, why is that? Well, it could include the near enemies. It could just be given the outer, kind of the outer donut, if you will, and it includes everything within. Or it could be that those inner ring of Israel's enemies have already been destroyed by the time this invasion takes place. It could be some other type of war where those uh, other nations are destroyed. We don't know for sure, but we know that these nations here are going to come against Israel in the end times. And all of these nations in Ezekiel 38, and this was written 2,600 years ago. Ezekiel wrote the names of these nations down. They're going to attack Israel someday when they're regathered to their land and when they're living at peace. Well, they're regathered now. The whole world's trying to figure out how to get them peace over there. And it says when that takes place, these nations are going to come against Israel. And I place this invasion during the first half of the tribulation because that's when Israel is going to be living under that peace treaty with Antichrist. There's only two times in the future that we know Israel is going to have peace. One's in the millennium. I don't think this is going to happen then. But Jesus Christ will be ruling on the earth. The other times during the first three and a half years of the tribulation. So that's, that's when I think this event's going to take place. So we haven't seen this fulfilled but again, what do we see today? The stage being set. All of these nations here in Ezekiel 38 are identifiable nations with the desire to attack Israel. They're all forming alliances with each other. And the Bible says someday they're going to pour down into the land of Israel and God is going to wipe them out. He's going to destroy these nations. You can go on and read about it at the end of chapter 38 and 39. Let me give the, si the seventh major signpost, and that is globalism. The Antichrist World Empire. Now think about this with me for a second. After Ezekiel 38 and 39, in the first half of the tribulation sometime, when all these Islamic armies in Russia come into Israel and are wiped out by God, that's going to leave a massive power vacuum in the world, isn't it? Well, who's going to fill it? I think the Antichrist is going to step forward and fill it. So I think that's one of the things that's going to catapult him to his world power. And he's going to break his treaty then with Israel. But think about our world today. It's, it's, it's globalism. The, the 90s were called the decade of globalization. How did our world start after the flood? After the flood, God told the people to scatter all over the earth. What did they do? They shook their fist in God's face and said, we're not scattering. In fact, we're going to go to one place called Babel, and we're going to build a tower there that reaches up under the heavens. And they said there, we're going to make our, a name for ourselves. Isn't it interesting when you go over to then a couple chapters later with Abraham, God tells Abraham, Abraham, I will make your name great. Big difference in life, isn't it? If God making your name great, or are you trying to make a name for yourself? That's what they wanted to do. God scattered them all over the face of the earth. Remember at Babel, they were all there under one man named Nimrod. All the world was there gathered under one ruler. God scatters people all over the earth. And what has been happening through time, down through the centuries? been coming back more and more we've gone from tribalism to nationalism now we're back to globalism satan's trying to get it all back to one group again where he can rule it all by one man isn't that, isn't that amazing and, and where where's headquarters of the antichrist going to be according to revelation 17 and 18 babylon it's all going to come back uh, to that place it's all going to come uh, full circle satan is the master globalist because he wants to dominate and rule the world. And everything we see today is towards globalism. You know, we have all the, the tools for world domination today. we got long-range missiles, global positioning satellites, uh, one world economy that's coming. Right after uh, the great economic collapse at the end of 2008, the, the G20 nations got together immediately, and there was all the talk, you know, Gordon Brown of Europe, Henry Kissinger, they're all, all talking about a global new deal to bring the economies of the world together and strengthen them so that we couldn't have the kind of collapse and the domino effect that had taken place before. What I think is going to happen is economic thing, you know, is the economy is going to continue to be unstable and sometime in the future, maybe after the rapture, we certainly know in the, the third seal judgment when you have to, when it takes everything you can make all day just to buy a loaf of bread, that there's going to be world economic collapse. And what happens when the economy collapses? People look to anybody who can save them. I mean, think about Germany in the 1930s. They gave their nation over to a madman, to Adolf Hitler. Why? 
because of the runaway inflation, hyperinflation they had in Weimar, Germany. So the world's going to be looking to somebody to bring order out of the chaos. And we're going to see a one-world economy, a one-world government, and ultimately a one-world religion. And we see everything moving that way. When I look at our world today, things in our world are shaping up exactly the way we should expect them to be shaping up according to the Bible. I mean, everything's coming together. Now, some people might say, well, there's always been signs of the times. People have always talked about them. What's different today? There's, a, there's two things that are different today, I believe, and I, I believe you can show this demonstrably. First of all, these things are converging like never before. Israel, 1,900 years they were gone. They come back as a nation in 1948. Europe, broken up for 1,600 years, begins to come back together in 1957. World focus on the Middle East just in the last few decades. The desperate cry for peace in the Middle East. The rise of Russia and radical Islam. Radical Islam really just began with the Islamic Revolution in 1979. The globalism that we see. All of these things happening within a few decades. And not only do we see a convergence of these things, but we see an acceleration of these events. It's like everything's on fast forward. Because today, when something happens in another part of the world, everybody knows about it immediately, don't we? Now, I live, I'm from Oklahoma, and you think about, you know, we had the Oklahoma land run in 1889. Think about some guy that lived in Oklahoma in 1889. You think about if there was a big war over in Europe. He could care less, right? Probably didn't know what was even going on. But if it was going on, what did it affect him for? He's farming his 160 acres. It had no relevance to his life whatsoever. Today, something happening in the Middle East or in Europe or in China, it has a ripple effect, and there, things are accelerated because we immediately know about them. And so there's the, the, the impact of them it really is just uh, um, accelerated exponentially in our culture today. So we live in this time of preparation, but it's very important to remember this. This is a key point. All these signs we've talked about, they're signs over here of the second coming. They're not signs of the rapture. The rapture doesn't have any signs. These are signs of the second coming. Now, if we can already see the signs of the second coming and the rapture hadn't happened yet, what does that tell us? Rapture's probably pretty soon. It's like the illustration. I think I used it the other day with you all, but it's like with Christmas. There's a lot of signs for Christmas. You can see that it's coming. Thanksgiving really doesn't have many signs to it. And if you can already see the signs of Christmas and it's not even Thanksgiving yet, then you can know that Thanksgiving's pretty close. And that's the way it is with the rapture. These are signs of the second coming of the Messiah. But we can see them now, the stage being set. And so the coming of the Lord could be uh, very, very soon. And the question for all of us today is, are we ready? I heard a story a while back about a young couple got set up on a date, blind date, and they were supposed to meet at 7. He was supposed to come pick her up at her house, and 7 o'clock comes, 8 o'clock comes, 9 o'clock, he still hadn't showed up, so she thinks she's been stood up, so she uh, goes in and takes her clothes off, puts on her pajamas, and puts on, lets her hair down, and takes off her makeup, sits down on the sofa with her some popcorn to watch her favorite uh, show with her, with her dog. Well, about a few minutes later, here's this knock on the door. And she opens the door, and this young man looks at her, and she looks at him. They're both shocked, and he looks at her, and he says, he says, I'm two hours late, and you're still not ready yet? You get, you'll get it in a second. But that's the way it is with the coming of the Lord, really, isn't it? You know, it's, he hasn't come. He didn't come in the 40s. He didn't come in the 50s. He didn't come. In the, a lot of people are thinking, well, he's not going to come. But one of these days, he's going to come. And the question for each one of us is when he comes, are we going to be ready? The Bible tells us, as we've seen, I think, here this morning, what's going to happen to this world. But it's much more important for you to know what's going to happen to you when all this comes down. What's going to happen to you? It's one thing we can say, okay, we've talked about what's going to happen to the world. But what's going to happen to you when these events begin to take place? You say, well, how can I know what's going to happen to me? You can know by putting your faith and trust in Christ. The Bible says that Jesus came and died on the cross in our place, that he rose again, and that he will save us and wash away our sins by just simple faith and trust in him. 
So if you've never accepted Christ this morning, you need to just say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I need a Savior. And I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior that I need. I I put my faith and my trust in Him. I I received this morning that full pardon that He purchased for me when He died on the cross. And I accept Him and I trust in Him. That's what you need to do this morning. You see, the decision and choice for every person who's an unbeliever, the choice they have to make every day is a choice between heaven and hell. A choice between accepting Christ and knowing your destiny in heaven or rejecting Christ and spending eternity in hell. But for those of us who already know Christ, we also have a choice to make every day. But our choice isn't between heaven and hell, it's between heaven and earth. What are we going to live for? We have a choice every day as a believer. Am I going to live for heaven, for God's agenda, for God's priorities? Or am I just going to live for this earth and for things that are, that are temporal and that are passing away? And I want to encourage each of you to think about that every day. If you know the Lord, you know, it's not the heaven or hell decision, but it's heaven or earth. It's the choice we have to make each day. What are we going to live for? And my prayer is that the Lord will help all of us to live for those things that really last, the things that count. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come before you this morning. We worship you and thank you for the sure word of prophecy that's like a lamp shining in a dark place. Father, I thank you for this local assembly of believers here. Lord, I thank you for each one of these dear people who've come out today to worship you together and to study the word of God together. I just ask your richest hand of blessing, Lord, to to be upon this church, upon the pastor and the the leadership and those who who serve here, Father. Just uh, pour out your blessing upon them. May your rich hand of blessing, Father, and power uh, be upon them. Father, we thank you that you are in control of the future. You have a sovereign plan that you're bringing to fulfillment. We thank you that we can know that future, but most importantly, we can know our own future through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, I ask now that you'd energize each one of us to live for Christ until he comes, to be faithful ambassadors for him, to be like people who are waiting for our master to return. We ask these things in his dear name. Amen. A word fitly spoken. Uh, Why don't you all stand? The worship team is going to close us in worship with a song that I personally love very much. Uh, You know, at the conference, for those of you who were there, you heard the word Maranatha. Well, that's how the Arabs say it, (laughs) or the Hebrews say it. Uh, Maranatha, it means, Lord, come quickly. So one of the emphasis of this fellowship is on the soon return of the Lord. Back in 2006, the Lord really impressed upon my heart that it was time, that there was no more time, that it was about time because his return was so close to begin to talk about what the Bible says about the last days about Bible prophecy. So that's why we started on Sunday mornings doing the prophecy updates. And that's why we had this prophecy conference this weekend. And that's why we've had the privilege of having Dr. Hitchcock here sharing with us. Now I say that to say this, as the worship team closes us in worship, and you're here this morning, and maybe you're walking with the Lord, but maybe not like you used to and maybe the Lord has really spoke to you here this morning and and uh, personally maybe even confidentially between you and the Lord he's spoken to your heart he's ministered to your heart and there's some things in your life that shouldn't be there and the Lord's saying that needs to go because I'm about to come and you if you have this hope need to purify yourself and get right with the Lord so you can be ready for the Lord. And maybe as they uh, lead us in song, maybe you can do some business with the Lord. If you're here this morning and you've never surrendered to Jesus Christ, 
you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, then after the worship, then we're going to ask you to come forward. There'll be some people up here that would love to talk with you and pray for you and lead you in a simple prayer. And you can leave here today a new creature in Christ, not the same that you came here today. And maybe you're here today, and this is probably maybe the fifth or sixth time you've come, and, and you knew that Dr. Hitchcock was going to be here, and so you wanted to come today. And, uh, but maybe you've been sort of checking it all out, scoping it out. And I want to suggest to you that maybe your search stops right here and right now. You've been seeking, but this is the day. This is the day of your salvation. This is the day that you choose whom you're going to serve. And maybe this is the day where you finally surrender and say, okay. I want to encourage you to do that, and I'm going to take it a step further and say to you, don't leave here. If that's you here today, if that's you here today, don't leave here today that way, because there's no guarantees. Well, I want to check it out one more week. How do you know? How do you know that you have another week? I'll never forget, while on the mainland, there was a young man. And I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with him and uh, prayed with him and he accepted Jesus Christ. It would be three days later that he would die drowning in a drowning accident. And I'll never forget that because there was a moment where I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to take the time. I don't really have the time. I'm not going to take the time to, you know, share the gospel with him. Boy, am I glad I did, because I know that today he is with the Lord, and I'll see him someday. Maybe that's you here today. I'm going to say to you, I'm going to beg you, if you need to do some business with God, then it does, it needs to happen right here and right now. Let's pray. Father, Thank you so much. We are so richly blessed. Lord, we want to ask you now by your Holy Spirit to enable us to take it to the next level, the next step. Embolden us, Lord, that we might take that which we've seen here today, that which we've heard here today, and, Lord, that it might become real that we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Lord, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. One last thing. Uh, if you're able to stay, we've got, uh, as we do every Sunday after second service, lots of good grinds, uh, good food, good fellowship, good friends, good fun. Not necessarily in that order. And uh, so if you're able to stay, we'd love to have you. If you're not, well, then God bless you and have a great week. Lord willing, we'll see you on Thursday night.